Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you, God, for this day. Amen. And for the mercies that are new because of you. And we just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said praise the Lord. Praise Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Suzanne, for opening. Worship team, praise the Lord. Thank all of you for your testimonies and prayer requests. Praise the Lord. And uh, man, I've got... I want to thank uh, John as well. John mowed the lawn yesterday. It looks great. Thank you, John, for, for doing that. Good to see Eric back there. Praise the Lord. He's got the uh, Nathan eyes on. Praise the Lord, right? Hallelujah. It's not bad. It's okay. It looks good. Praise the Lord. And uh, Sheila on the other side, thank you guys for stepping up and helping out. And uh, again, uh, Mike and Suzanne just kind of covering all the bases and appreciate them as well. Praise the Lord. So God bless you all. Amen. God is good. And you are unique, just like everybody else. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you. This is pretty deep, so just kind of stay with me. Think of this now in terms of nationalities. Okay. So if you're Russian going into the bathroom, and you're Finnish coming out of the bathroom. But are you in the bathroom? European. <laughs> there you go. You got a little geography and well, it's all good, right? Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, well, enough of that. Praise the Lord. We'll get a move right on. I, uh, I'm going to recap... For those of you that were here Wednesday night, you're going to be bored for the first few minutes here, but I'm going to kind of recap what I talked about Wednesday night because it just helped me to move into the, uh, the message for today and kind of set things up a little bit. But I believe that, uh, you know, we, we have preached grace and uh, some things that uh, I think are just critical. It's not just another message. It's not just something that, you know, make us feel good about ourselves. But I do believe it's the core for everything that God wants to do in our lives, all of us. Amen. And so sometimes we look at it as, well, you know, well, that's good for me because it saved me from a lot of problems. Amen. But unless we really embrace it, it's hard to move forward. It's, I mean, we can talk about it, we can get it intellectually, but to have it really deep down inside of us, that's what changes us. That's what makes it possible for God to really minister into our lives and through our lives to others. And so that's why we go over it and over and over and talk about it in a lot of different ways because it is critical. It is Jesus, you know, grace and truth came in the person of Jesus Christ. So you can't separate it any more than you can separate God from love. They are one and the same. And so for all of us, this isn't just about other people. It's about me. Amen. It's about you. It's about us as individuals and how we, amen, then, you know, interact with the world, with everybody else out there. You know, I'm not going to go too far with this, but let me just, let's just look at this uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, Sheila. And again, this is just kind of a recap from Wednesday night, and I'm going to go through it quickly, and then we'll just move right into today's message. And I still... Hopefully I won't keep you real long today. It's a beautiful day. Amen. And I got trees being cut down at my place. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. And it's not me cutting them. That's the good news, right? <laughs> Amen. So looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. We read it once more. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So here's the deal. When we miss grace, a bitter root 
begins to grow. Y'all know people that are religious. And I'm not against religion. I'm just against religion that is about me and not about Jesus. Amen. But we've all known people, and maybe we were even to some degree this way ourselves, that when we don't operate in grace, the result is bitterness. Bitterness in me that then translates into the way I deal with other people. Amen? In the Hebrew culture, any poisonous plant would be called a bitter plant. It would have a bitter root, in other words. So here in this scripture, the bitter root is a metaphor to make it clear to us that when we miss grace, stuff becomes toxic. Things become toxic. And I, I won't have you go there for the sake of time, but in Exodus chapter 15, 23, it talks about Moses and the children of Israel were moving and they, they needed water. And the water they came to was bitter water. It was Mara. It, it was called Mara. It was bitter water. So what did Moses do? He, God told him, take a tree, take this tree over here and throw it in the water and it'll make the water sweet. Well, the tree obviously represents the cross. It represents Jesus. It represents grace. Grace was thrown into the bitter water. The water became sweet and it was drinkable and everybody was blessed as a result of it. Amen. So what I'm saying is religion without grace is poisonous. Amen. A church without grace is poisonous. A heart without grace is is poisonous. When we miss grace, the poison of bitterness and anger eventually become too much to be hidden. Yes. And it will eventually destroy. Praise the Lord. Yes. Now Romans 3.23 says, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. <laughs> Say everybody. 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 All. Yep. Amen. All have sinned. All includes you. Amen. <laughs> All includes me. Amen. How do we respond to that information? That's the question. Well, yeah, I mean, technically I've sinned, right? But I haven't sinned, sinned. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Amen. I'm not that bad. We dismiss our sin. Our need for grace. And we do that by comparing ourselves to others. Yeah. Do you know what you're doing? You're sinning. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, I think it is, says, we are unwise comparing ourselves among ourselves and measuring ourselves by ourselves. You get bad results doing that. Amen? Luke 7, 47 talks about a woman who was forgiven much. Amen. And so she loved much. Our love for God is paralleled with the degree of forgiveness that we've received. That's why we really love God. If we realize what we have truly been forgiven of. Amen. We're forgiven. I'm not saying we're not forgiven. We're, we're going to heaven. We're saved. But we still screw up. We know we do. That's why grace is so critical because otherwise we're condemned all the time. That's what religion does. Even though you're born again, they'll tell you you're backslid. You're this, you're that, you're the other thing. And you're going to bust hell wide open unless you do this or do the other. Amen. It's because we don't understand grace that we're unable to give grace. Praise the Lord. So, okay, I'm a sinner. In fact, I'm a big sinner. But I'm not the biggest sinner. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey Amen. I'm speaking for you. I'm, I'm trying to help you out so you don't have to say it. Praise God. Amen. Here's what 1 Timothy 1.15 says. Paul is speaking. And Paul said, and Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What revelation he had. He was drawn up into the third heaven. He had these tremendous encounters with Jesus, manifestations and, and the glory of God and so on and so forth. But Paul said, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, which I am the worst. Chief sinner. I'm the worst sinner. Amen? So here's what I'm trying to say. The more I learn about the righteousness of God, the more I learn about the grace of God, the more I learn about the love of God, the more I examine my own life and my motives, and the closer I'm getting to the inescapable conclusion that I'm the worst sinner I know. I, I know what you're thinking because I can think of people that have done stuff I haven't done. 
But that's not the issue here. All have sinned. All come short. All depend on the grace and the mercy of God. And the moment we start measuring, the moment I start saying, well, you know, I never did that. I've never had one of those. I've never been there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The more I realize how great God is, how good God is, how much God is love, how graceful God is, how gracious God is, the more I realize I'm the, probably the worst guy I know. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So the penalty for our sin, no matter what that is, no matter how lightly you'd like to write it off, it's a light sin, it's a white sin, it's not a bad sin, it's not this sin, amen. The penalty for our sin is death. And we can minimize what we've done, but the Bible says We've been declared guilty. All are guilty. All have come short. Amen. And the sentence for that is death. For every one of us. Amen. So then Romans 5, he starts talking about because the gift of God is greater, the abundance of grace comes when, the, when sin is abounding and so on and so forth. The diagnosis is we are with sin. And our condition is terminal. Amen. And the antidote is Jesus. Yes. The antidote is grace. Praise the Lord. So, on the one side, we have sin. And your sin is worse than you can imagine. Amen. Amen. This is the problem with religion because people think, well, I mean, I, I'm really not. Look, you're lost and going to hell outside of Jesus. Whether you did anything on the big list or you did the worst on the big list, or if you just did only one little thing on the list, you're done. You're guilty. You have been tried and found guilty, and the consequences are death. Amen. Amen. So, praise the Lord. You can minimize it. You can rationalize it. You can try to dismiss it, but you are terminally ill. Amen. On the other side of the equation is God's grace. When Jesus died on the cross, His blood wasn't infected by the sin. Jesus became the antidote. The antidote that cures us. After putting your sin on one side and God's grace on the other, He says, grace is superior. Amen? So again, back to Romans 5 where He talks about sin abounds grace does that much more by one man sin came death entered in so on and so forth by the by the second man the second adam jesus grace came and forgiveness and eternal life so nobody has done anything so horrible that grace won't cover it grace is always greater no matter what that's hard to get your head around because even though we all know we've all done stuff i didn't do that stuff doesn't matter. That's the point. Until we can embrace this, there's always going to be a root of bitterness in us that not only affects the people that we contact with, but it affects us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Paul's explanation in Romans 5 about the greatness of God's grace is helpful. I mean, it really is helpful. But an explanation of grace without experiencing grace is like being terminally ill and the doctor says, hey, I got this pill if you'll take it. You can be cured. And then we say, no thanks. I don't take pills. Amen? This is my point. To know about grace, but not experience grace, is the same as having an antidote and not taking it. So we can, that's why this has got to be in us. It's got to be more than just some head knowledge. We've got to know more than there is a cure out there somewhere, if I could just find it. No, the cure is right here, but you've got to take it. You have to receive the grace. See, the greatness of God's grace means I don't have to keep trying to convince myself that I'm not that bad. When all the time I know, I probably am. At least at times. Or at least in thoughts. Right? 
So I don't have to keep struggling with this thing inside of me all the time saying, well, come on, I'm not like that, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that. All the time knowing, yeah, but you jerk, you would, you could, you, you're, it's possible, you've got attitudes and you've got behaviors that aren't under control totally. Right? right? right. I know this is a revelation to you as your pastor, but y'all can vote for another one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Tr the trouble is, he'd be just like me or worse. The truth is, I'm worse than I ever wanted to admit. Yes, yes. But God's grace is greater than I could ever imagine. Wow. Praise the Lord. Wow. That is the good news for all of us. Yes. Okay, that's the recap from Wednesday. Now, let's look at this. Matthew chapter 21, verse 19 through 21. Matthew 21, verses 19 through 21. See, I want to... The truth sets you free. Yes. Religion doesn't set you free. It just, it just changes the bondage. Yeah. And religion and grace mixed doesn't do you any good either. Because mm -hmm. a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah. So unless we can get totally free from this me thing yeah. and make it about Jesus, I'm still going to struggle with me. Mm -hmm. right. Amen? Unless grace totally dominates my life, there's always going to be little things in the back of my mind saying, yeah, well, yeah. you might as well because, you know, you're yeah. screwed up anyway. You know, yeah. you lost your temper and said something you shouldn't have said. You did this, you did that, you thought this. Anybody ever have a dream? You wake up in the middle of the night, you go, oh my God. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Oh it came from your subconscious. It came from your mind. Praise the Lord. And it is, it, because it causes us to question, who am I really? Now, I didn't do anything, but come on, the thought was there, and Jesus said, if you think it, you're guilty of it. So when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now I've talked about this in some other terms, but let me just go back over this just a little bit. Jesus is cursing not a tree because it didn't have figs on it. That's the symbol. That's the symbolism of it. He's cursing the idea of man thinking he could cover his sin. Remember all the way back to the garden, Adam took fig leaves because he had disobeyed God, didn't believe God, and was tempted by the enemy to do something he shouldn't have done. And then he's exposed. His sin has, been, has exposed him. And so what does he do? He, he goes out and gets fig leaves to cover the reality that I've been busted. I've been exposed. I've been caught. Amen? So... It's this idea of man thinking he can cover his sin or his nakedness with fig leaves. It's the whole system of man-made, self-effort, religion. It's, a, it's the idea of I can do something to make me holy. Yet all the time knowing I'm unable to be holy or righteous on the basis of anything I can do. So, innocent blood has to be shed for there to be a covering. Right? God had to slay an animal and give him some skin, some fur, something to cover him up. Type of Christ, the type of Jesus being slain, the innocent, for the guilty. Amen? The fig tree is connected to Mount Sinai, where the law was given. And the reason I know that is because immediately after Jesus says, you, you know, if you believe, you could, you could do this to the fig tree yourself. And if you could do it to the fig tree, then you could say to this mountain, which is the extension of man's way of trying to do things himself, it's religion. He said, you could say then to the mountain, be thou cast into the sea, and it would have to obey you. It would be able to manipulate you or control you anymore. Wow. Amen. So the fig tree is connected to Mount Sinai, the works-based man developed intellectual type of religion. B, 
be thou removed and cast into the sea. It's the sin of self-righteousness. It's the sin of I'm better than somebody else because I've kept, I've kept almost all the list. Right? Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. Micah 7, 18 and 19. See, I believe God's got a purpose and a plan for this church, for us individually and for us collectively. Amen? But there's a means by which we arrive there, and it isn't by religion. Because y'all, we all come from different backgrounds and different religions and different kind of ways of looking at uh, our relationship with God. God's got us on a path. And that path is that the glory of God would fill the earth, that His pronouncements over our lives individually and collectively will come to pass. But there is a path. Have you ever wondered why you were here and then you were here and then you were here and now you're here? We think, well, we just stumbled into this. You know, I was doing this and didn't have nothing to do, so I showed up here or whatever. No. God directs the steps of the righteous. God's putting people in places to accomplish His purpose for their lives individually and collectively. But we have to be in agreement. We have to walk with God in order for that to be fulfilled. It isn't God withholding from us. It's us being out of step sometimes. And I don't mean that in a sinful way. I just mean not until we can really believe how much God loves us and how much He has forgiven us. It's hard to have the freedom and the liberty to trust God for everything else that He wants to do in our life. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, we're always second-guessing Him. We need a healing. I love what Karen was sharing with us this morning, what, what Don was talking about with dope. See, that's the will of God. We know it is because it's what the Word of God says. But if we're, if we're struggling with our identity and with our goodness making it possible for this to happen, it doesn't happen. Because we see that we're not worthy. I fouled up back here. God shouldn't probably heal me. He probably shouldn't move in this area of my life until I get my act together. That's not true. God wants to do it. He has declared us righteous so that He can bless us in every area of life. But we've got to believe it in order to receive it. All right? So who is God like unto thee? That pardon of iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remainder. So who is God? Who's, who's He like? Who do you know that's like this? Is what He's saying. Who do you know that pardons iniquity? Who do you know that passes by the transgressions of the remnant of his hair? Who do you know that wouldn't expect to get somebody punished for their behavior? Amen? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Well, he did it. This is prophetic, but he did it in Christ. That's what he did. Removed them as far as the east is from the west. Can't be found anymore. They're gone. The sea of forgetfulness. Let me ask you a question. Why did Peter betray Jesus, but John didn't? Fear. Peter was afraid. John wasn't. John believed in the love of God. The disciple whom God loved. The only difference is one was afraid and one wasn't. One believed in the goodness and the righteousness and the grace of God. The other, not so much. Why? Because he knew he betrayed him. Because he knew his own heart. Make all the profession you want, but inside he knew, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I'd like to be, but you ever notice how people that talk all the time is because they don't want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because it might challenge them. You know? <laughs> Amen. As long as I'm talking, I can control the conversation. Praise the Lord. John believed in the love of God. And Peter believed he had punishment coming. That's why Jesus dealt with him three times. He said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my lambs. You know, he, he's trying to get it across to him. Look, this isn't based on 
your perfection. My feelings for you hasn't changed. When, he kept, when Jesus rose from the dead, one of the first things he said was, go tell the other disciples and Peter. He singled him out. Let him know. I'm not mad. I'm not upset with him. I love him. The same as I love John. The only difference between Peter and John was John knew that Jesus loved him. It wasn't that Jesus loved John more. It was just that John knew that he loved him and he, he lived out that. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 through 22. See, I'm saying Christians can do bad stuff. And most of the time it's because of the bad stuff that's in them. Because they don't believe in the goodness of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. They're still trying to do stuff to make themselves acceptable and they fail and then they feel even guiltier and it drives them into even other things that the enemy can then manipulate. Yeah. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that might that burn with fire, nor unto the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they had that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai, amen, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Praise the Lord. So you didn't come to fear and trembling. You didn't come. That's a mountain that's supposed to be cast into the sea. Amen. Hebrews 12, 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, grace, amen, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Grace is what he's talking about. It's time to have faith to be able to curse the fig tree system, the religious ideas, the mountain of religion of self-righteousness. Amen. Amen. Zechariah 4, uh, verses 5 and 7. The mountain of self-religion. And we can call it whatever you want to, but that's ultimately what it always comes back to. What have you done for me lately? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by your ability, not by your power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Religion. Before Zerubbabel, who just said that it wasn't by might or by power. He said, so what's this mountain? What's that got to do with me before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it. You see the connection. That's what he's telling us here. He's saying this is what has to be done to religion. Jesus came to fulfill that. He didn't come to start another religion. He came to fulfill the demands of that first one. And so that we can then come when the religion comes back at us, we can shout to that and say, Grace, grace, I am delivered from my need to perform because Jesus performed it perfectly and accounted it to me. Even though I come short of it every day, God still has declared me righteous, holy, acceptable in the beloved, deserving of everything that Jesus got, everything that he paid for. I am an heir and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. Healing is my right. Prosperity is my right. Long life is my life. It's my right. So every time religion tries to come and take it away from me, I'm supposed to be saying, Grace! Grace. Praise God. Praise God. So I'm not talking about living a sinful, lawless life. But we live out of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What, what, what causes our behavior to change is the inward working of the Holy Spirit. Not my discipline. I've been there and done that, and believe me, it don't work. It'll work for a little bit till I get bored or get tired or get angry or get frustrated, and then I resurrect, hallelujah, and do things that I shouldn't do, say things that I shouldn't say, think things that I shouldn't think. 
It's not your human effort. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God, man. We've got to, we've got to just quit just knowing this intellectually. We've got to live this. We've got to believe this. We've got to embrace it because it will change our lives. And it will change the lives of everybody that we come into contact with. Praise the Lord. So let me, let's, let me just take this a little bit further. Look at Matthew chapter 18. And I'm going to read a lengthy... In fact, I'm going to read almost the whole chapter here, or at least the last two-thirds of it, for a reason that will be obvious in a moment. But Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35. And we've all read this. and had, We've been taught this in Sunday school and different things in the past. But So we come up... To, there's, this is the result of a question... And then Jesus goes into this parable to answer the question. He says, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. That ought to tell us something. We're supposed to be carriers of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom will be in you, right? So, there, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. He had a big debt. But for as much as he had not to pay, or he didn't have the, the wherewithal to pay the debt, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children to be sold, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence and lay, laid his hands on him and began to choke him, took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, Have patience with me and I'll pay you all of it. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he could pay or till he would pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told it to the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if, you be, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So in Matthew 18, Jesus tells a story of this unmerciful servant. And he does it so that we can understand the greatness of grace that we have received. But also the grace that we are to give. In this parable, you find that grace is only grace if it goes both ways. It can't just be coming to me and never going out. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Take drink of this water, he said, and you'll never thirst again. There'll be a river flowing through you, but it has to flow through you. It can't just be for you. It has to be through you. It even goes back all the way to Abraham. I'll bless you so you can be a blessing. I'm not going to just bless you so you can be blessed. I'm blessing you so that as you are blessed, you will automatically bless other people. So grace is a two-way street. It's receiving from God, but then refusing to give it to others isn't an option because grace has to flow. Amen? Amen? Let me make it more uncomfortable for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? So we're preaching grace and we're, we're excited, we're glad for it because we need it. But we don't understand that maybe we're not experiencing all the grace and, and have it really settled in us as it should be because our lack of real embracing of that grace or, or believing in it causes us to withhold. Causes us to judge others because in the back of our mind we think we're still being judged. And this is human nature. This is Psych 101. And I'm not a psychologist and don't claim to be. I'm just saying this is, this is just human nature. Amen? So the litmus test for the reality of grace that you have received from God is the extent to which you're willing to give it to somebody else. 
the extent to which you offer forgiveness to the one who deserves it the least. In Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus with a question. That's the reason for this whole story. Jesus comes to Peter with a question. It's a generic question, but I bet there's a specific issue that motivated it. Look at Matthew 18, 21. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Right? So Peter brings this math problem. He brings this equation for Jesus to solve. He says, is grace greater than an offense that has been repeated over and over? How many times does Peter have to forgive somebody who hurts him? He even makes a guess at it. He tries to hit the right answer, right? Seven? And he probably thinks he's being really gracious. Amen? Because the truth is, you can look, uh, Eidersheim and other Jewish scholars say that the Jewish rabbis taught that you should forgive three times. The fourth time, you didn't have to forgive. So when Peter throws out the number seven, He's probably expecting Jesus to pat him on the back and say, Way to go, Pete. You're finally getting it. You're understanding. Man, what a good guy. What a good man. That isn't what happens. But maybe Peter had somebody in mind when he asked the question. Maybe he thought he had been gracious enough. Maybe... For you, maybe for me, it's not the number of times, but it's the degree of the offense. I don't know who Peter was talking about specifically, but it must have been somebody that he knew and that he knew pretty well. I'm just saying, I don't think this is just some random theological question from Peter. There's a face and a story behind the question. Maybe when you hear this story, the face comes to mind with a story that you'd give anything to forget. Maybe Peter's question is one that we'd like to ask too. Yeah, Jesus, how far is too far? When is the hurt done greater than the grace that you want to give? When does grace run out? When you do the math, the equation isn't Jesus saying 70 times 7 or 490 times. It's Jesus saying grace is always greater. It's not easy to swallow. And we know of a specific situation that's on some of our minds right now. That's not only what I'm dealing with. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about this is our lives. This is more than an incident. This is more than as, as horrible as any might be. This is about Jesus trying to set us free. Yes, amen. This is about Jesus trying to give us totality of salvation. Sozo, nothing broken, nothing missing. Shalom, peace. And we want to hang on to our opinions and our emotions, not realizing we're robbing ourselves. We're stabbing ourselves in the throat, thinking we're being religious and being spiritual. Praise the Lord. Maybe you're willing to accept this grace is always greater on some level, maybe, you know, intellectually. You want to believe grace is greater. But emotionally, the equation just doesn't work. It just doesn't feel like forgiveness is possible. My question is this. Are you at least willing to try? That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. Matthew 18, verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain man. This is Jesus' response right after he said 70 times 7, Peter. 
or grace is always going to be greater. He says, then the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which would take account of his servants. So he's saying it's like God's opening up the books and calling us to give account. Yes. It's a reminder that outside of Jesus, we are all in deep debt to God. We're in debt because of our sin, and we are unable to repay. We cannot pay the price. It's impossible for every one of us. Praise the Lord. Until you can see yourself as the chief sinner, the way Paul saw it. That's why he preached grace the way he preached it. He said, I'm the worst. Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. We don't like to say that because we could look around and find somebody that does something more despicable than I've done or worse than me, but this is the reality. We've got to come to the place where at some point we realize I'm the worst. Not somebody else. Me. The servant in Jesus' story is confronted with this huge debt he owes, and he realizes he knows what he deserves. He deserves to be thrown in prison because he's got this debt and he can't pay it. Look at verse 26, still Matthew 18. See, we've gotten to where we don't think our debt was that bad. I can see why that one ought to be thrown in, you know, the jail until they can pay their debt, but, you know, mine isn't that bad. I can, you know, give me a few months or a few years and hopefully I can be a good enough person that I'll pay it off. It ain't going to happen. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Now the master knows that's not going to happen. If he could have paid it, he would have paid it. He can't pay it. But incredibly, he takes pity on him anyway. Verse 27. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He didn't just forgive he did away with it. He gave him grace as though it had never been a debt. Amen? He doesn't extend the note, right? He doesn't lower the payments. He just does away with it. He completely deletes it from the records. It's a great debt, but the master's grace is greater. And then the parable takes this disturbing turn. Verse 28. But the same servant, the one that just got this grace, went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. Way less than what he had owed initially, but still a debt. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, Pay me what you owe me. The guy that's forgiven finds another co-worker who owes him and he begins to attack him and demand payment. This is another servant. It's just another guy. Amen? A co-worker. Verse 29, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. Exactly what the first servant had said to the master. Now, don't miss this. He's being asked for the same grace that he got. And actually, he's asked for less. But he had received grace. All this guy's asking for is some of what you just got. Verse 30. Look what happens. He would not, but went and cast him into the prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. Did you ever wonder about that? The other guys, the other co-workers, the other people were really sorry when they heard about this. And they came and told it to the Lord what had been done. They're sorry because they live in this community of grace together. They live in this community of grace with this master who doesn't treat them like servants, but he treats them like family, like children, like sons and daughters. And they're really sad. Verse 32 and 33. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired of me. Should not you also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? So in the middle of this story, 
about grace, we find a lack of grace for the person who isn't gracious. You see what I'm saying? In the middle of this story, amen, about grace, there's all of a sudden this comes alive that there is a lack of grace for the person who isn't being gracious. Why? Because he said, you should have done this. You should have done the right thing. You should have done what I did for you. Amen? Now that might seem counterintuitive when we think about God and we think about grace itself. But it's not. God isn't cursing anyone. But as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see what I'm saying? Hurting people hurt people. Guilty people want everybody to feel guilty. To a thief, everybody's a thief. You ever, you ever been around people like that? They think... They think somebody's trying to steal from them all the time because they've been stealing all, they've been ripping and playing the underhanded little tricks all the time. So they assume that everybody else is doing the same thing. Why? Because as a person is in their heart, so are they. So if we don't believe in the grace of God, we always think of God as being angry and judgmental and, and going to get us, then we end up acting out that same way. You see, Jesus extends this radical grace to everybody He meets. Everybody, go through all the Gospels. Everybody He meets that gets caught in sin, He's extending grace to them. Except for the Pharisees, amen, whose sin was their refusal to offer grace. So it's not counterintuitive. It's exactly what you get. It's the result of sowing and reaping in a, in a sense. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. I'm not picking sides in any debate. I'm just saying, for me, the chiefest of sinners, I've got to have this. I've got to have this. I've got to live this. I want to experience everything that God has for me. And I can't afford to be screwing around for another 20 years that I may not have. Right. Wow. He's given us something that is so precious and so powerful in the grand scheme of what God wants to do that for us to turn it down is like the idiot that has a cure for cancer and says, sorry, I'm not taking it. Yes, yes. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. That's what God is saying here. Jesus becomes of no effect. He, he doesn't impact me at all if I'm trying to operate by my own ability instead of by grace. Okay, I've received grace. Now I want to act out with everybody else with the law, even to some extent with myself. That's what he's talking about in this parable. Today, Jesus is our community. The church's community. Or you could say the church is Jesus' community. Just like this, this magnanimous, great master had this community that he was continuously giving grace to. And the people were sad whenever that got disrupted. Because they knew it messed everything up. We don't live in a normal environment like other servants and slaves. We live under this master who is so gracious that he treats us as though we were actually his children. He doesn't hold our debt against us. He writes it off. He pays it off. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Today the church is this Jesus community, this grace community. And it's based on Jesus. It's based on everything that he demonstrated through his actions and through his teachings, amen, our core value is grace. It's not get even. It's not live up to this standard. It's not keep all these rules. It's grace is the core belief. Matthew 18, 32 through 35.
Then his Lord, after that, had called him, said unto him, You're a wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you desired of me. Should not you also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, excuse me, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry. He was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. That's what Paul's talking about when he says if you go back to your responsibility, to you taking responsibility for this, then you've fallen from grace and you end up tormented. It isn't God, it isn't like God is coming and tormenting us. We know we're, we live in the dispensation of grace. The problem is, how many people do you know that are born again, but are miserable, who are tormented all the time because of guilt, because of something they thought or something they still can't get past or whatever it might be. Not because God has commanded a tormentor to come get them, but the result of not believing and receiving the grace of God ends up in torment for you and for everybody you interact with. That's the message that he's trying to get across to us. It isn't, it isn't this confused idea of God being angry or God isn't angry. No, God's just saying, here's the result. The result of not receiving grace is law. You, you're going to have to deal with one or the other. And if you mix them, you don't get the benefit. You just get the torment. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. I, I, th th we need to be free, church. We, I mean, we need to just quit trying to pick out, and that's a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin, that's not so much a sin. But, hey, the sin is coming short. The sin is not believing in the grace of God. It isn't the stuff. It isn't the thing. All that has already been dealt with. Jesus already paid the price for sin. The problem is we keep hanging on to it, wanting to name stuff. Jesus told him, he said, you know, why, having been delivered from this, do you want to go around worrying about keeping this day, keeping that day, not having one of these, not doing one of those, not drinking this, not eating that, not doing... He said, you're just being foolish, having been delivered from the law, why do you want to put yourself back under the bondage of it? For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespass. Now it sounds like God is making some arbitrary decision here. The truth is Christ is in you. You and He are one. So when you don't forgive, there's a sense of guilt and shame that comes to you, not from God, but just because of the act, because of the way you're thinking. Is that making sense to anybody? This isn't God's judgment. This is the result of you acting out of yourself and reaping the results of that. Jesus said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Do you ever think about that? Why? Because the more I forgive, the more I sense forgiveness. You see what I'm saying? The less I want retribution, the less I feel the need of having to pay retribution. It makes me act like God. And when I act like God, I identify with God, I feel more comfortable in what God has promised me. Sometimes it's just saying, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth getting even. It's not worth getting over. It's not worth the retribution. Go ahead, Don. I'm just going to say, No, I don't think I have it in my notes, but it sums up everything yes. said in that and tells us the two commandments Love. required. And if I believe correctly, I don't sin. That's it. The seed remains in me. Exactly. Jesus, who is the embodiment of God, who is love, yes. Jesus comes in that reality bringing grace because only love can produce that and then that's what and that's exactly right Don. that's what he's saying so here there's only two commandments love God love your neighbor as yourself do that you fulfilled all the commandments 
So, but we're still digging up. We're still trying to name stuff. We're still trying. That is a sin. No, not. It's not. The sin is falling short of the belief that God has dealt with everything. Because if you don't believe it, there's guilt. There's going to be guilt. And if you feel guilt, you're going to project guilt. If you have, if you're afraid, you're going to. Pre you know, bullies are fearful people. They're, they're people that are afraid. And so they go around intimidating everybody else out of their own fear. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm, I know that it, you know, it's not simple. It's a journey. But it begins with the first step. Jesus answers Peter's equation, he says, with his own. He says, the grace you've received is always greater than what you're going to be asked to give. That's a given. That's just the bottom line. Last scripture, and we'll quit. Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 10. No, not the last scripture, but almost. Philippians 3, 8 through 10. Praise the Lord. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Be found in Him, not having my own righteousness. See, Paul, this is the Paul that said, I am the worst sinner. I want to unload everything about me and just trust in Jesus. Just be found in Him. Amen. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. I told Sally the other day, we were just talking, and I, I don't know what I was, I'd been working on the house, I'd been scrubbing the north side, you know, it gets mold on it in winter. Uh, so I'm cleaning that out, and I just, you know, nobody to talk to, you know, just me and the Lord, you know. And I just was thinking, you know what I really want more than anything else? Is to know Jesus better. You know, I mean, we know him, but you know what? At times, I realize I don't know him very well. I maybe know him better than somebody, or maybe know him better than I did 20 years ago. But I, I want to know more. I want to know him better. I, I want to be closer. I want to feel totally connected. You know, I mean, secure. I guess maybe is the word. You know what I'm saying? That's what this is all about. That's what I'm talking about here. That sets people free. I know it would set me free. Because every day I, I have moments of guilt, which I suspect y'all do. Even when it isn't like we've done some horrible thing, it's just we've come short. We know that I could have handled that better. I, I could have dealt with that in a little better way. I, it doesn't have to be like that. And it leaves you kind of un uneasy, uh, uncomfortable, you know. Not that the world's not coming to an end, but it just makes me realize I, I haven't let go of everything that's keeping me from that. And I don't mean that in a religious way. I just mean embracing His love, accepting His forgiveness, His mercy, His grace. So that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. So righteousness is not the product of performance, but it's the result of grace. We have to curse the fig tree and cast the mountain into the sea. We've made it all about stuff. And ultimately, it could lead to stuff. But he said, if you'll seek first the community of God or the kingdom of God, the stuff gets added. If we would cast the mountain into the sea, curse the fig tree, we'd find ourselves a lot closer to God. I believe that when people truly feed on the sincere milk of the Word of God, not our religious interpretations, but just simply, just what, like what Don just said, what God really said. Not trying to figure out, well, was that a sin or wasn't that a sin or did so-and-so sin or didn't so-and-so sin. We do stupid stuff. Everybody does. But we're all sinners. We're all the worst. But grace is greater. Praise the Lord. I believe that when we really understand that, we become immune to sin, which is so what you just said. Do you see what I'm saying? We become immune to it. 
because we're not focused on it anymore. We're dealing strictly with loving God and loving you like I love myself or like I want to be loved. Exactly. <coughs> we'll become what Jesus said, immune to sin, inoculated with His righteousness. But you got to let go of all of it. You got to just not think about it, not be interested in it, but focus on God's love and our relationship with Him. Amen. Feeding on the diet of grace without the works of the law. What happens? Faith rises in our heart. We believe God for anything, man. For all that He's done for me, for how He identifies with me, I can believe Him for anything. I can believe Him for the dead to be raised. I can believe Him for the kind of financial breakthrough. I can believe Him for healing. I can believe Him for deliverance. I can believe Him for a life that's more than 75 years or, or whatever the going rate might be. Right? I can believe Him to live till I'm done. Right? To believe and tell, hey, when I'm finished, okay, let's go. Be like Enoch. Walk with God. Then he just wasn't. Amen? Moses. Eyesight never failed. Never got weak. Never got sick. Just went away with God. Praise the Lord. James, 15, uh, James chapter 5. This is the last scripture. James chapter 5. Verses 15 through 20. The prayer of the faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Wow. This is what we are to do. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that, he might not, that it might not rain, that it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Praise God. Here's what I believe. The miraculous will break forth in every dimension when we seek the kingdom, when we seek the community of grace. It will sadden us to see when anybody doesn't operate in grace because we'll know they're cheating themselves, they're robbing themselves of this great gift that God wants to have them receive and experience. All things will be added. The finished work of Christ, receiving grace, giving grace. He says, awake to righteousness and sin not. See, if you awake to righteousness, sin's over. Sin's gone. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to share that you're saying exactly, speaking to me exactly what I needed to hear. Even Thank the Lord. That's how God can free us. That's it. And, you know, there's a couple scriptures that you spoke on here that came to me before you even spoke. And I just thank God for working by His Holy Spirit. Um, confession falls one to another, the anger that I was feeling. It's because of something that's been done to me over and over and over. And it's been by a Christian, which I've done that to somebody else myself. Maybe not over and over. But God is dealing with me. And, and I already know the things that have been said. But... 
I've really got to just let that go, even though it's been very hard. I mean, I could have all these excuses, but he's been dealing with me today just after hearing some of this is forgiveness. And I believe that he is working that in me to do that. Yeah. And to show the grace on that I need to. And to just forgive. I can't say just because it's hard. We have, we have the same spirit. So I'm, I'm saying it would be easy to identify this with one situation that we all are aware of. That wasn't my intent. That's obviously on my mind and it's troubling and, you know. But I'm saying this is about me. This is about you. This is about you. And Rita, no matter what it is, that you're dealing with, I promise you, we could all raise our hand and say something. Now, to you, what I'm dealing with may not seem as bad as what you're dealing with. But on the other hand, what somebody else is going through, yours may not seem that big a deal. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah. personal. Yeah. But everybody struggle, is struggling with these things, and that's why the Holy Spirit wants us to be set free. He's trying to lead us and to guide us into all truth. This idea of picking and choosing our sin and, and, and naming and identifying all these things. Yes, there's behavior that is unproductive and counterproductive, but it's not sin. It's, it's just flesh. It's just human. And, we, and, and until we can embrace this, it's hard to let go of any of the other stuff. No matter what it is, if it's just anger, just bad thoughts, just unforgiveness, if it's whatever it might be, it all comes down to the same thing. It's robbing us of our true inheritance. It's robbing us of everything God wants us to experience. And it's robbing us of God. It doesn't make me feel good to be like that. And to have exactly. And to have those, you know? So the guilt comes back. Like I said, you know, you can't... When you go there, there's consequences. And believe me, people that act out, they're carrying something. I mean, they've got something tormenting them. There is a torment that they've been turned over to that they don't want to, but they did, or they do. And unless you can lose that thing, I mean, we know gener what we call generational curses. I don't believe in generational curses. You know, Jesus suffered the curse. The problem is if our mind hasn't been renewed to that, we can act out behaviors that we've been delivered from and don't even know it. That's the challenge of recognizing. Look, as I, as I said, I'm the worst sinner. This is, this is like a revelation that Paul had, and I think I'm seeing it some. Without that, I can't see myself as this one that God loves the most. You understand what I'm saying? The way Peter and John had this thing... John just always said, the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, he loved every one of them. He didn't love, he doesn't have favorites. He's, it's like I said in the very beginning. You're unique, like everybody else. I mean, in the eyes of God. It, it, we don't think of it that way, we, but, but because he wants us to feel unique. He wants us to feel like we are his favorite because he, we are. The thing is, so is Don. So is Rita. So is Sally. It's not taking anything away from the total love that He has for me, the total grace that He's extended to me. And if we could ever understand that. You know, I mean, you think you could think of all... I mean, I, it's just gone through my mind for the last week. All the things that we do growing up as kids, we, we rebel against some, you know, control of our parents or lack of sense of... Uh, love or commitment or caring and, and inner and so we go out and try to find it someplace else or try to reproduce it somewhere when in fact it can never be done. It's like it's like two broken people going out and getting married thinking that they'll become whole. No, now you got a marriage that's broken. You see what I'm saying? God wants us to be whole because unless we're whole, we can't bring wholeness to others. So 
Let's determine to believe in the love that God has for us. And just see how that begins to operate in our lives. Without trying to say, okay, I believe how much God loves me. That means now I won't ever sin. I, I can't sin. Sin doesn't exist for me anymore. And, and until I get there, I'm always going to be measuring every behavior or whatever as a failure. And that failure will keep me in that cycle of failure. It's being set free from that. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You'll find peace for your soul and deliverance. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Paul said, we labor for this to enter in. That's the only labor there is. The only work there is is entering into His grace, into His rest. God bless all of you. Appreciate you today. Have a great week. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.